Yeah, somebody just said Victor's 20's out. Victor's 20? Mm-hmm. I thought they weren't coming out with it this year. Yeah. Or no, that was no. the toasted. I was like, we <laughs> we interviewed them, and they said they're coming out with another yeah. Victor's 20. <laughs> See how much attention you pay, right? I don't. <laughs> About like Fred, he's like, you're a whiskey pig? Yep. <laughs> Talk to you. <laughs> we hung up for like three hours, man. <laughs> I carried you back to your room. <laughs> this week's release was a bit delayed. I was traveling again for work, but this time to Hawaii, so I'm still recovering a bit from island time. This episode with Fred Minnick has a lot of great gems, and we cover a lot of different bases. I have to say that I love Friend's opinionated demeanor because he doesn't have an alliance for a particular brand, so he can be very truthful about almost anything. You're going to enjoy this episode. Next week is the last week for making your pledges to be a part of our October giveaway. We're going to have a multiple winners again, this time the choice between glassware and books, including the book we discuss on today's podcast. Make sure you support the show on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash bourbon pursuit. On Tuesday, the 25th of October, we're going to be hosting the second Bourbon Community Roundtable on YouTube Live. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, as well as Blake from Bourboner.com, Carrie from Suburbia.com, the fellows over at BreakingBourbon.com, and a possible surprise guest from Brian Hara of Sip and Corn's Blogspot. The link to be a part of the live broadcast to ask your questions will be available soon on all these outlets, so please join in and be a part of the fun. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here today, and we are in Prospect, Kentucky, in a little well-known neighborhood called Norton Commons, talking to our guest in his office today. But before we kind of introduce him, I think we should introduce it with a, a story of how we actually, you know, Ryan has actually known our guest for a while, but we actually have a pretty funny story on what we thought we were going to have in one of our first episodes. Yeah, so I've known Fred for a few years, and like, so I, we, when we talked about starting this show, I emailed Fred. I was like, hey, man, uh, can we get you on the show? What can we do? And you're like, hey, I'm actually going to this uh, event at Churchill Downs with Harlan Wheatley at Buffalo Trace. And I was like, oh, sweet. And you gave us tickets, and you're kind enough to do that. We show up. We're, like, scrabbling together to get, like, podcast app and, like, microphones. We put a microphone right behind where Harlan and Fred were sitting, and we're like, man, this is going to be golden. Great first episode. We get through the whole thing, and then I get the laptop, and I realize that we didn't hit record button, and it's like, <laughs> fuck, what the, <laughs> all that waste of time, but, you know, that was going to be our very first episode, so sort of appreciate you uh, yeah. trying to get yeah, us that started. Was, uh, uh, that was our, uh, at the Kentucky Derby Museum, that yeah, was yeah. part of our Legend series, and that was a good night, because uh, Harlan revealed some juicy stuff. Yeah, we had some good stag, and some good, yeah, yeah you were interviewing, and he, he revealed some good info there, for sure. Uh, I re- one of my favorite things of that night was was giving him shit about naming a vodka after himself. <laughs> yeah. you know? I like that one for sure. <laughs> but, uh... So you've heard his voice. Now let's introduce him. So today on the show, we have Fred Minnick. Fred is an acclaimed bourbon author and media pundit on all things bourbon. If you see him out, he's always dressed to the nines. He also happens to have today the Amazon number one best-selling book in the whiskey category, Bourbon, the Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Whiskey. So, Fred, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. That's a, that's a nice intro. Yeah. yeah. Well, Very before, fancy. before we dive into the book and kind of talk about, you know, life as an author and everything about that, kind of talk about your life before bourbon and before whiskey. So, I was, uh, I'll, I'll give you the kind of the story of how I became a writer. I, I grew up in Oklahoma and I showed pigs and I was an FFA. I was real big into and that sort of thing, and we were winning a lot of awards. And my ag you teacher come to Louisville every year. Uh, actually, that was the... that we I did. I came to one year, uh, and then we went to Indianapolis, and they used to be in Kansas City, so it was a little bit everywhere. But uh, there was uh, there was a time we were winning all these awards, and my ag teacher said, "Start writing articles about it," and I did. And I went to the fax machine, and I faxed my articles to the Oklahoma County newspaper, which no longer is in existence. And they ran the story on like page four, and I saw the I saw my name on the newspaper, and I was hooked. And I just I've been writing since then. Um, and the, I was in the military and got sent to Iraq. I was an army photographer, and when I came home in two thousand five. Uh, I moved to Louisville to be with the woman who's now my wife, and the only job I could get was as a food food editor for a trade publication. And when you write about food, you eventually write about booze. <laughs> and I went out on my own in 2006, and one of the first stories I wrote as a, as a freelance journalist uh, was about the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Uh, that article appeared 
in successful meetings in uh, the the winter 2006 2007 issue and in fact i have actually never seen seen that uh issue but uh i remember filing and i got paid for it um but so that's kind of it all started about 10 years ago and at the time there was not really anybody uh in kentucky writing about it it was just uh mike veach you know giving talks but no one was trying to bring a, a professional uh, writer voice to it from Kentucky. You had Chuck Cowdery doing great work, but he was in Chicago. Um, and you had Whiskey Advocate and Whiskey Magazine write about it, but they would be sending writers in from New York and from Scotland and, and from everywhere. And so I kind of made it my my career goal was to like carve out carve out this niche. Um, and the first one of the first things I wanted to do was write a bourbon history. And um, publishers came back and said, no, and as an author, you're, you're dictated to. You don't really have a lot of choices. And so I wrote um, Whiskey Women in uh, between 2010 and 2013 when it came out. And Whiskey Women was the book that kind of put me on the map in a lot of respects um, because it, it, it gave women a voice who never had a voice before. And... After that, I wanted to write a bourbon history, and people said, no, we want a tasting guide. And I really didn't want to write uh, Bourbon Curious because I was like, there's so many tasting guides out there. But they're like, no, 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 believe me, this is going to do well. You want to do a tasting guide. And so I said, okay, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it my way where I will disclose people's recipes and break things out kind of like uh, sommeliers do by flavor profile. And they said, okay, we'll do that. And I'm glad I did that. It was a, I was a finalist for Tell's best, you know, spirit book in the world. And, um, you got a lot of free bourbon out of it, probably <laughs> lots yeah. of free bourbon. And, uh, um, <laughs> That, that, that's that, one of the perks of the job, right? That we're stealing right now. <laughs> well, actually, we have a real nice assortment up here. I wish folks could join us, but uh, you know, we got. Uh, can I tell you what, what we're? Yeah, yeah, sure. Tell the listeners what, what we're doing right now. I, I, I'm I'm tasting with these guys: the Old Forester 1920, Four Roses Limited Edition Single Barrel, uh, 2014, and Evan Williams uh, Barrel Pick uh, for the Icons of Whiskey. The uh, Joseph Magnus uh, Straight Bourbon that's finished in three different casks. Uh, the Bellamy Ten Year Old Sherry Cask finish from uh, Jack Rose. And what is actually my personal favorite on this table, the Russell's Reserve Barrel Pick from um, the package liquor store Lincoln Road in Mississippi. So basically what he's saying is our afternoon's ruined. <laughs> yeah. I, this, this happens sometimes when you write about bourbon. Yeah. You're like, um, well, I'm just going to taste one thing. Some friends come over, and before you know it, it's 6 o'clock, and your your wife's calling you, hey, when are you going to come home? So, you know, you made Bourbon Curious a, a tasting book, and we've talked to um, a few of the people that have tasting books out there, and they had a, a, an idea when they were actually writing it that says we can't do many in a single day so what was your process of going through to be able to say i gotta i gotta be able to get through and make a tasting notebook and i've got to do 50 100 how many of a bourbons so how am I gonna, and how am i going to do this because so i'm fortunate where i have a lot of experience in uh, in professional tasting um you know going back to my days when i was a contributing editor for tasting panel magazine which is a trade publication you know i've been involved with you know professional tastings for you know, close to 10 years. And there's a process. Um, you taste and and you spit. And it's basically that simple. And it's like you see it and you see people doing it in wine and everything. And, you know, the, the obvious follow-up to that is, well, do you get the finish? And yes, you, you still get the finish. It's still on the tongue after you spit. And you don't have to actually swallow it all the way down to see if it's, you know, smooth necessarily. But when there are things in question, I will kind of set it off the side and, and taste it when, I, when I'm able to swallow. Um, but, you know, when I'm at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, uh, we taste 1,500 spirits. And I have to, you know. How uh, many days? Uh, over a three-day period. Holy shit. <laughs> and, that's, that's well, and your palate get fatigued? And each person doesn't do all 1,500 of them. At the individual, you get about 200 when it's all said and done. But... But you taste, you spit, you taste, you spit. And my palate um, is 
kind of train for it, but that at the same out. time, you do. That is kind of like the the Super Bowl of tasting in some respects. And I'm also a judge on the World Whiskey Awards, and we get quite a few, quite a few, you know, not as many. Uh, but when I'm tasting in my kind of confines, where I'm doing the pouring and the tasting and all, and all that, um, and while I'm writing, I will do try to do three a day. Uh, and, and usually, you get a you get a book deadline. And it's usually doing a year, so I would do like you know three a day, and um, and it's the same with like whiskey advocate. Like I have my, I have my deadlines pretty far out, and I know what I'm tasting pretty far out, so I try to do three a day. Um, and sometimes you come up against the wall, and you're like, ah, crap, I got to get these in quicker, or you know I got to speed things up. Like for uh, another book I'm writing, I mean I've got, I've got 120 rums I have to taste uh, in less than a month, so. You you just kind of you, you schedule it out and you and you do the best you can to get in three a day, but there are times you have to crunch them in. Um, but um, I know when my palate's gone and I step away <laughs> and I won't and I won't won't score it. And there there are some there are some brands that are kind of like um, you know baselines for me that if I go back and I taste them and I think they're good, then I pull off. You know, then I was like, you know, I can't taste anymore. Mm-hmm. I got a question about writing. So like, what's kind of like your process of doing a book? Are you just like, when that moment comes, and you're like, I got an idea, let's go with it? Or do you have like a, I come here every day at the same time, crank out a few bad pages, see what's, what I, works? I, there's a, every writer has his own, his or her own, uh, his or her own methods. Uh, a lot of people are very disciplined and structured and have to be at a certain place at a certain time. I can write anywhere, and, and I think that comes from my time in the newsrooms, and it came from my time in uh, Iraq when I had to uh, write things for the Army. Um, it was, uh, I, I can write anywhere, anytime, but what I have noticed is that when I do try to schedule it, I can't write for shit. <laughs> yeah. So my best writing comes when uh, I don't need to, Right. Uh, but in a, and also when I'm on deadline, like if it's due like in a week or tomorrow. It's amazing how quickly I can write it. Um, and I'm very fast. That's probably, as a writer, that's probably one of my greatest gifts is that because I'm always thinking about what I need to write, I can just churn it out. As soon as I find my voice for whatever the book is or whatever this article is, it, it comes just off my fingertips pretty quickly. Cool. So I want to go ahead and kind of switch gears and move to the book itself. So mm-hmm. your latest book is Bourbon, The Rise and Fall and Rebirth of an American Whiskey. And I want to read everyone the first line of it so they have an idea of, of what they're in for. So bourbon is more American than apple pie. It existed before baseball, has built more roads, schools, and government infrastructure than any other non-petroleum domestic product. And you finish off the thought with, Bourbon is good for America, and it's time we understand the historic intricacies that make it so unique. So I want you to talk a little bit about your inspiration just behind writing the book in general. Yeah, so going back to the – I've always wanted to do a bourbon history. And so now when I finally get the opportunity to write it, there's all these great books out there. Uh, Reed Mittenbuehler's Bourbon Empire was a beautiful book. Chuck Cowdery's uh, Bourbon Straight and then later Bourbon Strange, beautiful books. Mike Veach's uh, Kentucky Bourbon and American Heritage, beautiful book. And all these books really told wonderful histories, uh, very accurate, very important in the, in the bourbon narrative. And when you, when you sit down to write something, obviously you have to write something that's different from what everyone else has done. Otherwise, why would anybody pick it up if it's the same thing as – as Chuck's or Mike's book. Yeah, and I think so, it's called plagiarism that's kind of frowned yeah, upon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> plagiarism is... I got away with it. <laughs> that's definitely frowned upon. Uh, but, but in general, the, the, um, the story has often been told you know, by the dis- you know, through the distillers and showing them, and uh, that's kind of been the format for, uh, for bourbon books since really the 1960s. Um, what I've always, what I wanted to do was tell it th- through a, a legislative and regulatory perspective, and that that first sentence kind of explains like it's important to America, um, and I and I basically went through congressional archives and uh, treasury testimonies, and found all kinds of material that would uh, show how important bourbon was from 
from our country's history um, and, and used a lot of like, uh, you know, public records to tell that story. Just, to, you know, an example, you know, we hear a lot about the Whiskey Rebellion and everything um, that happened in the 1790s when George Washington imposed a uh, excise tax on whiskey distillers. Um, but what in, in Bourbon, I bring out the fact that when Thomas Jefferson repealed that whiskey tax in 1802, he was thought to be placating to the rich. And so distillers were in some respects considered the one percenters of 1802. And by uh, repealing that tax, he was thought to be helping the rich and hurting the poor. And so that's just one little, one little nugget. Um, also, I spent a lot of time on things like uh, the Bottle and Bond Act, or kind of like how it came to be and the people who opposed it. People like Isaac Bernheim didn't want the Bottle and Bond Act to happen because they thought it was a way to thwart uh, Canadian whiskey efforts that were growing in this country. Um, during Prohibition, you know, we all know that medicinal whiskey was served. I wanted the answer. I wanted to answer the question of how and why, and come to find out bourbon distillers actually had to work really hard to make sure that medicinal whiskey was uh, available. And part of the reason why was they, that was the only way that they could realize uh, their investments. The rye distillers had made agreements with uh, people in the Bahamas and the Bermuda and Bermuda, and they sent their barrels of whiskey to those islands, which they would later be bootlegged into the States. The bourbon distillers tried to make similar agreements with Cuba, but Cuba wanted too much money per barrel. And so there, uh, as Prohibition loomed, they were kind of stuck with all these barrels of whiskey. And so they lobbied for uh, medicinal whiskey. But when Prohibition begins, there's not really much of uh, knowledge of how it's going to be done. So on the very first day of, you know, first week of Prohibition, distillers are getting arrested because they're trying to pull out um, whiskey in their, uh, in their warehouses to put in the medicinal market. And, you know, distillers would get robbed. The doctors of the time would be constantly, uh, requesting, you know, requesting whiskey and they couldn't get it. So they would buy it from the bootlegger. And to put this into perspective, this was during the time after Spanish influenza. So whiskey was the, one of the only treatments for that. And this was before, you know, penicillin and, um, you know, the antibiotics we have today. And so whiskey was the, the choice medication for something that could kill you. And you had all these states trying to get medicinal whiskey, but not all of them would allow it. West Virginia and Indiana were both bone dry states. And they'd have these politicians trying to lobby for having medicinal whiskey. And they would make up these colorful stories about how their aunt was saved in Illinois <laughs> with a pint of whiskey and it just it was a very colorful time but uh it was also a very serious time uh and then after prohibition world world ii hits and the bourbon distillers are making industrial alcohol the bourbon industry has been very uh proud of this statement uh and i've always been kind of interested in it what i learned was that they made it but it was kind of begrudgingly they were kind of they were forced to in, in most in, in many ways um and the the distillers were also the larger ones were buying up the little guys and so we in the between like 1939 and 1955 we saw a lot of independents get gobbled up by shinley seagram uh and on the cooperage side Brown Foreman was buying up the Cooperages. So it was a very interesting time that would put them in Congress under investigation by the Department of Justice. So there's there's a lot of kind of uh, drama unfolding in, um, in our political system, uh, all just circling around bourbon. And that's what really a lot of the book is about. And I also studied the trends of the times and why bourbon came to be so popular and why it started to take a nosedive. Um, it, yeah. More popular now or back then? I would say in the in the 1950s, we probably had a little bit more popularity because it was not as uh, there were there was not as much competition. Um, the the U.S. government didn't even have a definition for vodka until until the late 50s. They they called it grain neutral spirit. 
and um, when they when vodka and gin and and the rum start you know taking hold and then scotch starts coming in here more it was um, it became much more popular um, I think it was much more popular just because there wasn't as much you know competition but with that said um, you know the bourbon distillers also knew that they had issues on the time and a lot of they were trying to uh, fight for exports uh, and the reason why a big reason why bourbon is a unique product in the United States from the 1964 congressional declaration is because they were wanting to um, export to England and the, to Brazil and everywhere where while they were getting penalized by those respective countries scotch was allowed to basically go into places tariff free and so they had when they became a, a unique product in the United States uh, that opened some doors so I want to talk a little bit more about the, some of the chapters in the book, right? Because, you know, I don't want to give anything away to the readers, but, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of things that, that you can read uh, just through Amazon and stuff like that. And and I want uh, I encourage everybody to just go out also buy the book, but, you know, kind of get a, a taste of for what's in there as well. So I want to I want to just say the title for a, a few chapters and I'll just kind of give you one and and kind of give the listeners like a, a sentence or maybe a, a minute or two of just maybe what they could expect. And, and the first one I thought was real good. I, I, I read the first chapter on Amazon, the, the whole entire thing, and it was called, it's called The Father of Bourbon. And I thought it was real unique in there how you, you talked about a, a regrettable story you had when you were in New Orleans. Oh, uh, that was actually in Savannah. Oh, Savannah. Savannah, That's Georgia. Right. So I was at this uh, spot uh, called the Alligator Soul in Savannah, Georgia, which has a really nice uh, bourbon selection. And this really sweet woman says... I'm related to the creator of bourbon. And I said, uh, oh, who's that? And I, <laughs> and Is your last said, name Craig? She said Elijah Craig. Her name was Maureen Craig. And you could just see the color drop in her face and her body posture change. I mean, my words actually, it crushed her. And I felt so bad for that. And um, it was, it, it was, it was, it was it was a very regrettable moment uh, in how I kind of handled that because you know I people say things to me all the time and I don't always say things back um, when it, when I know they're wrong and and I shouldn't have said that but that that moment kind of piqued my curiosity as to who should really be called um, the father of bourbon uh, and in bourbon curious the you know I say we never we probably never will um, definitively know. And I still don't think we will definitively know. But in this section, I give people who've been credited with being called the father of bourbon. And there's one guy named Jacob Spears who's kind of been um, lost. You know, he's been he's been lost. There's not a brand named after him. There's not a distillery. Probably will be now. Yeah, actually, the <laughs> trademarks have been purchased, I saw. Uh, but he is a guy who has always been a known distiller. Um, we know he was a distiller at least in 1790, but what we did not know was that he was actually distilling in the same area as um, Elijah Craig was allegedly distilling. And uh, he's always been the guy that people point toward as, like, giving it the name of bourbon. So I put a lot of uh, – I kind of did a little bit of, uh, you know, as I would with any any research paper or whatever, I – I've made some conclusions. Now, it is not a smoking gun or any definitive answer that says he is the – there's not a piece of paper I have that says I invented bourbon. We crown you as – Yeah, bourbon. nothing like that. <laughs> and technically, the new charred oak thing that we, give, we, that we give bourbon doesn't really come out as a regulation until the 1930s. So you could – you know, you could have just been making corn whiskey in the nineteen or in the seventeen hundreds and call it bourbon. But so was Elijah Craig real, or is he just? Oh, Elijah Craig was real, and he was a distiller. Um, he was uh, uh, he was more of kind of like a a businessman. So he did a lot of different uh, things. Uh, the what what hurts Elijah Craig is not anything about him. It's the the people in the nineteen fifties and their effort to get bourbon to be a unique product of the United States, they created these legends about him. And one of the legends that they created was that he invented bourbon by uh, through an accident of a barn fire. And it was specifically 
the the barn catches fire and the barrels char on the inside. Now, I am not a, a forensic fire How's that happen? You know, person, <laughs> but how does the inside of a barrel get I'll charred on the it, outside? Yeah. But but I have figured it out, Ryan. It's the immaculate charception. <laughs> <laughs> he was a preacher. He was. Right? He was, was he a Baptist really a preacher? preacher. No, he's a Baptist preacher. Okay. He actually was he was loathed and loved gotcha. as a Baptist preacher, but he was um, um, you know, he's in the in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, a guy writes a book on the history of Kentucky. It says the first bourbon whiskey was made at um, the fueling mill at um, in, in Georgetown, and he owned it. So it pe- sometime later, people put two and two together and said he created the first drops of bourbon. And indeed, he did have a distillery, but we don't we don't have anything more than that. Uh, what really hurts all of this is the is the kind of like county rivalries we have in Kentucky. You know, Scott County, Nelson County, Jefferson County. Um, in the 1800s, they were very much trying to stake their claim on everything that they possibly could. You know, even today, I mean, Kentuckians refer to themselves from the county, not from their hometown. Or where'd you go to school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's they're the very... high school. It's the high school. It's the high school. Yeah. I think that's specific to Louisville. <laughs> it yeah, might but, be. It might be. But get it, you get out in the country and, and you know... It's it's very different. Uh, I, mean, but, I might be a little biased, but I think everything from Bardstown is a little bit better. <laughs> no, just kidding. But so that's the <clears throat> that's a little bit of that story of a, of the father of bourbon. I think if you read that, you're going to get a, a much better picture of who was doing what uh, and some of the distillers that really mattered. Um, and you're also going right. to see some um, really mainstream names like Abraham Lincoln. And Daniel Boone, so you have um, you have a lot of uh, people you know from our American history in there. Never heard of the guys. No, no, <laughs> no that? I'm just kidding. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> so the next few chapters in the book, it talks about going through the you know we we kind of touched it on already. Government friend and foe, uh, going through prohibition, uh, big business after prohibition, and then the, another chapter is, is chapter eight, the bur- the boom of the bourbon image. Mm-hmm. Now, is this relating to uh, the marketing side of the house of, of all the all the things that came out in regards to then of Blends trying to rule the world. That was really uh, a time when the bourbon, the an organization called the Bourbon Institute, put their heart and soul in connecting um, America and bourbon as much as possible. Uh, they were, are the ones who created the Elijah Craig backstory. Um, they all to add to that backstory, they said that he invented. Bourbon on April 30th, uh, 1789. <laughs> the specific date. The same day that George Washington was sworn into office. And so I, in the book, I said the only way they could have made it sound more American for the time was that, you know, if it destroyed, beat up a KGB operative or something like that. Chuck's <laughs> Budweiser. Yeah, I, it, was, it, was a, um, it, it was a PR effort. It was a legislative effort. And uh, it was kind of a no holds barred. I mean, if people get mad today about some of the backstories that brands create, they would have been livid with, with how they, back then yeah. with how they did things. But fortunately for bourbon, uh, the internet didn't exist. Um, but there was one guy who opposed uh, uh, bourbon becoming a unique product in the United States. And actually, there is. In, in their discussions about it, they called uh, they called bourbon our native spirit. Uh, so they actually did use that um, term in their um, in their discussions. But there was one guy, uh, Lane, James Lindsay, who is a congressman out of New York. He protested it and he fought it. He fought it to the point where he was able to table it for a vote, uh, and they weren't able to get it voted on for April thirtieth. So, and the reason why is because he had. He had connections to a, a Mexican distillery that was making Mexican bourbon, and that was uh, he was trying to uh, reserve their ability to continue making Mexican bourbon, which, by the way, is god awful. That sounds hot. <laughs> I, 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 Mexican I've, and bourbon. <laughs> I've had Mexican bourbon, and it was the um, the second worst whiskey I put upon my lips. So. I'm sure you don't want to talk about the first one. The first one was a corn whiskey out of Tennessee, distilled in like 1909. I actually just tasted it this year. But if you can imagine distilled horse piss, it's, <laughs> it's, that, pretty, it's like, I imagine that's what it tastes like anyway. 
<laughs> so I guess the we we'll want to touch on one more chapter, and I thought it had a very interesting title, and it's called "To Beat Jack Daniels." So Jack Daniels is blowing up. I mean, it is destroying the the liquor world, and, and it's getting in. It's getting uh, placement all over the world, and a guy named Frank Sinatra can't stop singing about it. It ends up on the cover of Guns N' Roses. Uh, Jack Daniels is everywhere. It's now, part, was Jack Daniels always owned by Brown and Foreman, or was it acquired? Uh, Brown Foreman. Uh, Brown Foreman acquired him in the 1950s. 90, okay. Yeah. So it was uh, it was a hot little distillery that everybody wanted, and Brown Foreman kind of got it out of, from underneath everybody in the 1950s. And um, it just, it was going gangbusters. And so everything that people would do was they would try to follow Jack Daniels. Like, uh, and there was one brand in particular that was following Jack Daniels all over the place. And that was Maker's Mark. And it was, it was so bad that... Um, um, they didn't make like Lynchburg lemonade with Maker's <laughs> Mark, did they? Well, <laughs> they did something worse. <laughs> They found a guy by the name of Jack Daniel, and they put him uh, in the same garb as Jack Daniels, and they said, wow, look, a guy named Jack Daniel really loves Maker's Mark, and they purchased all these full-page ads everywhere, and it, it was a national <laughs> ad campaign. Uh, and then uh, Bill Samuels Jr. is throwing a, throwing a party, and he invites Owsley Brown, who's the you know head guy at Brown Foreman, and he invites him to the party. And he's like, okay, fine, well, I'm going to go. And he goes to the party. And guess who's playing at, as, as the uh, entertainment? The Jack Daniels Band. <laughs> and so uh, as sources told me, he's like, he came back from that. He's like, well, somebody please create a bourbon brand to get Maker's Mark off of Jack Daniels. And that's allegedly how Woodford Reserve was was created was basically as a uh, competition for for Maker's Mark and and the thing is is it worked it worked and Woodford Reserve is a I don't know if you will find a more loyal fan base than Maker's or than Woodford Reserve. I totally agree. Yeah, and, it's a staple in many bars. Yeah, uh, and I, I was on an airplane once, and this lady said this 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 guy sitting next to a lady gets uh, Woodford and Coke. And this woman, I mean, she just really rares up. It's like, you mean to tell me you're going to pour Coca-Cola <laughs> on the world's best bourbon? I thought she was going to punch the guy. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I don't have any war stories like that from the air, but I, I do see every once in a while because I fly Delta. Delta's got Woodford on there, and every once in a while you see somebody order it, and I'm like, you know what, I'll just take the take the advice of some of the other past guests and say just enjoy it how you want to enjoy That's it as long right. as you're drinking it, right? Well, see, I'm not affiliated with a brand, so I can say whatever I want. Yeah, there you, you go. You know what? There's some brands you don't you don't need to pour with Coke, and I I actually think Coca Cola mixing is reserved for you know real basic bourbons. I wouldn't yeah, actually. Woodford is kind of borderline, but for that one, I, I wouldn't put it. In it. I would do ice on it. I <laughs> yeah. Well, good. We'll take your advice on that. And I don't want to really touch on chapter 12 because chapter 12, I think uh, you need to read at least the first 11 chapters to understand <laughs> the title of chapter 12, which was, it's the potential downfall of the bourbon brand or the bourbon industry at some point. So I don't want to touch on that, but it just gives a, a little inkling to our readers of, of things you can't expect. And so definitely go out there and buy the book. But another question through all this, uh, and kind of the last question about the book is, you know, what did you learn about the histories of the brands through this process of writing like is a lot of this kind of stuff like you kind of knew before or is it you know you learn more about yourself through this or just anything like that you know i learned that there's a lot we don't know uh and i found some i found some old um old notes from a from a previous distiller and talking about things um, and he was a second generation original Kentucky distiller. And he was basically reciting everything his dad had said uh, or his grandpa had said. Um, and it just, in reading through that, it, it was like there's so much in bourbon we don't know. And, it's, it, and I hope we find out. I hope we find out more distillers, um, more, you know, more things that they did in the 1800s and 1900s but uh, w there's enough people looking now that I, I think we'll we'll have a lot more questions answered in in 20 years uh but 
there has been this space has been dominated by the archives of the distillers and i think that um and what i hope that my book does is kind of like start looking more into the archives of of the federal agencies that touched the distilleries because um what i was able to find was pretty pretty cool um and there's there's been a lot of trade negotiations where bourbon is was on the table and tennessee whiskey was on the table you know like new zealand and australia the only countries that you can get bourbon bottled at 74 proof and it was in their trade negotiations you know so there's for people who like history and um think that everything's been kind of told already in bourbon i've got news for you we're just getting started you know um i'm just one writer you know i think chuck cowdery's got another book in him i think mike veach has got another book in him uh, and i hope reed mittenbuehler with his talent brings another book to the table so just keep a space open on your on your shelf for for more bourbon histories because there's a lot more to be found volume two right? or in yeah. your kindle <laughs> or in your kindle there you go <laughs> actually kindles are pretty amazing because you can you can highlight yeah. and you can search i'm a big kindle fan <laughs> so i know i'm going to probably open up a can of worms here and dive into a rabbit hole but i think it's uh while we got you here it's a, it's a good it's a good time to ask this because there was a, a pretty good discussion that was happening last week on one of the forums and everybody, you know, you ask one question and everybody's got an opinion. So everybody, of course, always asked. Uh, and you were in there and you were talking about it. But the argument was that, and by the way, this is, we're all over the book now. So there was, we're just talking about whiskey in general here. But you, it, was, uh, it was a question that said, uh, is a bourbon that's actually finished in a barrel, can it still be considered a bourbon at this point? Or should they start creating a new category? I would like them to see a, a new category. Um, I, love, I love the flavors, first of all. I love the flavors that come from these barrel finishes. I love them. They're, they they bring a new element to it. That's and we're drinking one of those right now. Yeah, the Joseph Magnus. And the thing is, as someone who studied bourbon uh, from a historical standpoint, and I understand consumer trends, if you don't present something new like this, you're going to lose like a good chunk of consumers. Uh, and so I would like to see a new category. As it is now, these saying it's finished and an X cask. You know, I don't know. I was really against that in the beginning. I, I really, really was. I, I was very anti. Um, Trying to keep it pure or whatever yeah, I, it is. I, and- but as I tasted more of them and, and I saw more uh, come out on the market, um, I, I, my mind started to change. It was really Makers 46 that opened my eyes, uh, you know, got me a little bit more onto the the barrel finish side, because this is what winemakers do. You know, winemakers uh, are able to do this. They're able to add staves and, and, and various things. And there were there were people adding barrel chips in the 1800s. So this this stuff existed uh, before us, you know, it, but there wasn't really legislation or anything like that holding it. It was just kind of a free-for-all out there. You know, remember, there, there weren't definitions until, you know, the Taft decision in, in 1910. So... You have a lot of the stuff has been done before, Um, but I I think the question that we have to ask is, does does it taste good and can we create a new definition? I mean, I can I would like this. I would love to see it. I would love to see a new definition. But if you think this is bad, take a look at rum. You know, you you have fake rum everywhere. You know, you have you have a sugar beet uh, rum. You have a sorghum molasses rum. And the definition on the U.S., U.N., and every other, you know, major global entity says that rum has to come from sugar cane. You know, this is so minor. This is such a minor detail in the grand scheme of uh, spirits in terms of definition and debates um, that in the larger purview, I don't, it doesn't bother me right now. Uh, what I'm, what I am noticing that is kind of getting troubling is you're seeing a little bit more go into um, you know, this whole bottle to taste, like so dropping the age statements. You know, that sort of thing is, is very concerning for me because I, I think that if you, if you don't have an age range, then how are we as consumers to, 
how are we able to, you know, taste and compare and contrast? Um, I, I have more concerns about, you know, the dropping of age statements and flavored whiskeys. Uh, I, I look at the barrel finish category as very positive. Does there need to be a category? Absolutely. But we also need people putting the state of distillation on their bottles, you know, so it, it is, it's, it's very low on the list of things that piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> so like with the regards to the age statement, I guess distillers are saying we're dropping it because we want to make it available. Would you rather be like Weller 12, we can barely even get any more or, you know, have Elijah Craig available, with, Well, uh, you know. Keep in mind, there a lot of it is a is a matter of what they choose to tell you, <laughs> and it's also a matter of what they choose to tell me, or they're even their own employees. Um, you know, there there are the obvious answer to to all this is they would like the profits, um, and they look at this not as like they do in wine with vintages. They look at these as brands versus you know, it's about branding that individual brand. It's not about um, it's not about making sure that they have enough for it to get out there. It's about making sure that they have, you know, they have more more penetration with that particular brand, and thus more cases in the market, and thus more profits backline. It's worth pointing out a company like Heaven Hill Bourbon's like it's like it, it's not their major money maker anymore. So. So the, the, the decisions they're making um, are not as powerful on their bottom line as it would have been, say, 1979 or 1982. But um, it's, it's disheartening to me because I kind of feel like a lot of the whiskey geeks were just kind of getting tossed off to the side. Um, but on, on the same token, there are people who see that, you know, and that's what's giving us something like, you know, Joseph Magnus or Bellamy. Now, these are two source whiskeys, but the way that they choose to do their styles, uh, to me, with their, their barrel finishes, um, are very exciting. And so there are people who are willing to say, all right, we're going to put an age statement on here. We're going to stick to it. Uh, you know, will it will handwrite it. Barrel bourbon, uh, you know, handwrites it. So you have a lot of people who are picking up, you know, that age statement slack. And so that is actually you know, positive. If bourbon is to take that next step, we need smaller distilleries to really make a bang. You know, we need MB Rollin and uh, New Riff and Rabbit Hole and Finger Lakes Distilling and, you know, Kings County. But, but can they compete against, you know, the, these big existing they brands? They cannot compete on a volume level. There's no way they can compete on a volume level, but they can compete on a quality basis. I, um, when I tasted the Kings County peated bourbon, my, I was blown away. I thought I was going to hate it. I was like, oh, this is stupid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> peated, peated bourbon. So um, you didn't have a confirmation bias? Uh, <laughs> no. Well, it, it, that's what I had going into it. And then I yeah. tasted it, and I was like, damn, they did something really exceptional here. And so, you know, they're, the, the distillers, we're, we're going to find out if age statements matter. They matter to me. They matter to you. I'm still going to buy Elijah Craig, <laughs> yeah. you know. But they matter to the whiskey geeks. The question is, does it matter to the new 25-year-old consumer who just read about bourbon and just walks into a store? Because that, that's who they're trying to capture, is that if they don't, if they don't capture the 25 to you know, 35-year-old age group who's just getting into bourbon uh, or getting into spirits, then they're done in 20 years. Like if you don't, if you don't capture that group now, then you're done. And I, and that's based on brand. It's not based on genre. They're they're going they're moving away from the pie is really big now. So now I think they're going more for that they're fighting more for that space on the shelf. And you can you can tell by listening to the master distillers. The master distillers don't talk about the category overall as much as they used to. Now they're talking about uh, within, you know, they'll talk about the category overall, but they'll get very specific about their brand after about two or three paragraphs. And it's their own point with communications. And that's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. That's their, that's their directive from their bosses, and that's what they want to do, and that's where they're going with stuff. Um, and the quality, you know, the thing is, if the quality's still there, 
then I'll eat some crow. But I think that you need, I think you need age statements in order to uh, protect the quality. I would rather see the price go up, but. You know, I whatever. think it, it could be part of a, a longer roadmap discussion, too, when you when you talk to some of these people, because if you're able to do a, a land grab now and, and get as many shareholders or get as many people buying your product now, the thirst for knowledge is always going to come later. Uh, as as we can see by talking and looking at all these people and these these <laughs> Facebook groups, Sorry, I mean, uh, there was a local group. It's OK. Uh, there was a local group that that went from, you know, just a, a, a handful of people to uh, now reaching over 600. And it just goes to show you that the thirst for knowledge is there. And once they start learning about things like Pappy Van Winkle and, uh, you know, bourbons that are aged 20 years or more, or even 10 years or more, they're going to want to get to there. So perhaps it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a land grab thing. And it's, as consumers get smarter and as they want to start getting more of this stuff, then... I mean, as we could see, even this year, uh, Parker's 24-year came out, and they just had a 24-year-old bourbon laying around, right? That's just going to go to show you that I think as the time's going to progress, they're going to bring out more of these age-dated bourbons that maybe people that are consuming more want to learn more are going to start trying to get. He's been talking to someone. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer, actually. Um, you know, I will say that there, if, if that's where we're going to go, just make sure it's good. Um, the, they are you. What Julian Van Winkle did with Pappy Van Winkle with the twenty-three-year-old, uh, in my opinion, is the exception uh, when it comes to older bourbons. There is often too much wood north of eighteen years old. Um, even a lot of eighteen-year-olds will have a lot of wood to them. And um, if 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 we're all we're talking about is like preserving the age statements past you know, 18, I have real fears for, for the bourbon industry because there was a time when eight year old bourbon meant something to people. And if you saw eight year old bourbon in the liquor store you're like, Oh, this is quality eight year old. That's it. Uh, but now, you know, they, they seem to think it's okay to drop it off. And it, I don't care what they say. They may say it's eight to 12 year old, 12, eight to 12 years old in the bottle. Uh, or they can say it is, you know, six to 15 years old in the bottle. Um, if you do not put an age statement on there, there is an assumption by a certain percentage of us that think it's just four years old. <laughs> and that's because that's what the regulation allows. And uh, I, I, it's something that I think could lose a lot of the hardcore bourbon consumers is the age statements because we're just... I mean, if you take a look at the last five years, we've seen the prices go up. We can't get the products we want anymore. The age statements are dropping. They're putting out more flavored whiskey. You know, what about the guy who brought you to the dance? And that's just it. It's like they don't care about the guy who's coming in from North Dakota anymore every single year to the Kentucky Bourbon Festival and uh, loads up his car with everything that he can get his hands on here in Kentucky and then goes back. Um, They seem to... That that guy wants age statements, or he wants a he wants some kind of a, a guarantee that his his whiskey is of a certain age. Uh, with a brand like Maker's Mark, who has always been quote to taste, um, I have a little bit more respect for them because they have always thought that about age statements. They've never had any of this. Uh, indication that age even mattered they're always about taste that's what they say now it it may have they lowered their projections of what they put in there i don't know i'm not inside there but i respect i respect the brands who didn't have an age statement in 1985 um and i have extreme disappointment in the brands that had an age statement between 1985 and 2006 and suddenly the age statements are gone because uh, and they no longer matter. If you if you read their comments, the age doesn't matter. Uh, it's about the taste, or it's um, you know we're trying to preserve the brand and do, do, or or like put it back on you and the and the consumer and say like, well we want to make sure you have it, so we have to do this. And so you know I think that's I think that's a little unjust from uh, you know to the guy who's been drinking you know eight year old uh, Jim Beam Black for forever and and that was the one where it really hurt for me was jim beam black 
Jimmy Black was the one where re- that one more than any of them pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> Why that one in particular? I think it's because that was my that was my mixing bourbon at the house. Uh, that was the bourbon when I'm on the road. That's what I get my Bloody Marys with. And now I can't even touch it. I mean, like, I have, like, such, like, emotional ties to Jim Beam Black. Uh, it was, like, it just pissed me off. <laughs> uh, and, just, and then it was, like, you know, Knob Creek was then. I was, like, all right, well, Knob Creek's where I'm going now. And so on Knob Creek, I, I kind of developed this amazing relationship with. And I feel like I had a little bit to do with it getting the, the world's best bourbon in uh, San Francisco because I that was the one where I tasted and I was like this is the one and and i was like this is the best one here and it, for that tasting it was it absolutely was there was not a better bourbon at that tasting and uh to this day uh i'm still amazed that knob creek won that one but at any rate it was um that was my bourbon that was like my bourbon because i had the nine-year-old guarantee and now <laughs> that's gone now that's gone so do you think you have a like an oprah effect on bourbon like you say uh, you know when you <laughs> when you taste something and give it a high rating that, they, like, there there have been uh so it, going back to my tasting panel days uh the the first one was weller uh the next one was uh jim beam and then knob creek um i i don't think it's i don't think i'm that <laughs> no i don't think i have an oprah effect but I, I think that collectively we all kind of taste the same thing, and um, we're not we're not all that far apart from what we all like. Um, if you take a look at the 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 broader like more the general like whiskey geeks, when we're all tasting something, we get really excited about it. We all tend to fall in line really with the same stuff, and we all dislike the same stuff. There's a margin of error, obviously, but. You know, one of them was being the uh, with the Knob Creek uh, that they released. Uh, what was it 2001? What was that? The yeah, oh, the yeah Knob Creek the, 2001. Yeah, it was yeah. this year. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was that was just. I think I scored that an 82 for a Whiskey Advocate, which you know is not a bad score, but I also scored Heaven Hill Six Year Old like an 83. So if you're willing to pay 150 dollars for uh, versus nine dollars, <laughs> yeah, for an 80, you know, for for that particular product then you know knock yourself out but um I, there's a lot of issues coming at coming at bourbon and i just i'm so concerned about uh more effort into designing packages and less effort with what's inside the bottle well, i think we're going to have you on again and it's just gonna be called a, an episode of you know what grinds for gears yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the family guy thing right yeah <laughs> It's and and sometimes it's actually easier to just talk about it than to write about it because when you write about it, it's like um, you know you you have to count on somebody reading it. Yeah, and then you get into another 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 topic like, oh, didn't you read that? Like, no, I'm like, oh, well, let me repeat myself. Right. You know, so actually, just just shooting the shit can be a little easier sometimes absolutely Absolutely. so we've we've reached we've gone way over our usual mark but this is fantastic i think uh, we've gotten a lot of good information out of this so if anybody if you want to find all all of fred's books including bourbon curious whiskey women and his latest book bourbon the rise fall and rebirth of american whiskey you can find all of them on amazon you can also find the links on his website at fredminnick.com for anybody that wants to learn more about what you're doing or how to get in touch with you personally uh your email list how how do they do all that um I guess just go to my website, fredminnick.com. I'm also very active on Twitter. Like if um, at, at any point in the day, if I'm if I'm on Twitter and you say something to me, even if it's like you fucking suck, <laughs> I'll I'll do my best to respond. Um, you know, but uh, I I I love Twitter. Twitter to me is like somebody asked me like ten years or whenever Twitter and Facebook were rivals. They're like, which one's gonna last? I'm like, well, I think it'll be Twitter because that seems to be like the news side of things. And Facebook is where people go to bitch and show cats, <laughs> so and babies, and yeah, then their meal, their entrees. Well, now uh, Instagram's taking That's care true. of that, That's true. but yeah. Well, yeah. until we can bid on mega balls on, uh, yeah, on Instagram, <laughs> I don't know, right? Exactly, no <laughs> raffles on there. Yeah, but yeah, anywhere, yeah, you know, just website twitter whatever awesome so make sure you follow fred it's at fred minnick on twitter make sure you follow us at bourbon pursuit on twitter instagram and facebook also support the show if you like what you hear on patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash bourbon pursuit thanks fred again uh glad we could hit record this time and uh appreciate you sharing uh 
some of your collection with us. Well, we, we're not done here yet, so well, that's but, true. Uh, we got uh, a few more we need to open up. Yeah, so I'm, we're gonna. Well, it's it's, it's a pleasure to get on. I really mean that. What you guys have done for in the in the bourbon area of, of podcasting is nothing short of amazing. Because I I. This this seems like a lot of work, so you know, <laughs> good for you guys for it's, doing it's it. It's real tough. We come in, we show up, you put six bottles, we drink them, and we talk. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's what we do. Yeah, there's there's worse things out there. Yeah, but again, thank you for being on the show, you and bet. we will see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey and for those who think a life without whiskey has no style thewhiskeywash.com mm-hmm.